big rabbit is with the teeth, the buck teeth. I used to have these big ass buck teeth too, so I knew he looked like this big buck teeth. Like the Brian when he was a salesman and family guy, just that smile and teeth out. I don't know, so everyone looks weird in veneers apparently, so screw it, who cares? I mean, I don't think that's anything to make fun of. So I wouldn't make fun of Joel Santana for it, coming back to that. He looks fine, he looks good. Um, but, you know, I'd, I'd be interested to see what drug he was I thought he was on Percocet, but that actually isn't um, for tooth decay, so he might have been. I've heard meth. Was Joel Santana on meth? That's crazy, right? Crazy to think about. But he did rap in the music video with no teeth, so I mean, you know, and rappers do sometimes rap about ice and stuff, you know, the Migos, of course, you know, and all their drug bars. Um, rappers do rap about doing ice, so you never know, maybe. Maybe it was ice and perks, that's, I don't know. I know the Diplomatic Ties from, the Diplomatic Ties album from last year by the Diplomats, who are Cameron, Jim Jones, Joel Santana, is a fire, terrific album. That's another album I should have put on underrated. Diplomatic Ties is underrated as hell. That was a great album of 2018. That was at the top of the list of great albums. I was really impressed. I'm, I was always individual Diplomats fan. I liked Joel Santana. I wasn't huge on Cameron or Jim Jones. Jim Jones I didn't like at all really. I liked 40 Cal and Hell Rel and um, you know, 40 Cal, Hell Rel, uh, you know, Jewels. But I liked individuals from the Diplomats and everything and Dipset. I didn't like, you know, the whole group and everything. So uh, it's uh, it's good to hear the diplomats together and even Jim Jones who I don't like as much they're all sounding good sounding good together Cameron sound good you know he, this was around the time he was beefing with Mace which is crazy I wish I was was on my podcast was out then so I could have covered the the Mace and Cameron reignited beef after 20 years that was fun Mace killed him. Mace put out a great diss track. Mace fucking killed him. I don't care what anyone said. But, uh, yeah, the Diplomatic Ties album was a classic. I think it'll go down as a classic because that was such a great comeback. They had the really fuck Soldier Boy and Tyga and all of them. The Diplomats had the biggest comeback in 2018. Book it. You hear it, heard it here on the I Feel Like Rhyming podcast. Kevin Max said, the Diplomats had the biggest comeback in 2018. Diplomatic ties. Check it out. Alright, so... Um, Alright, where were we? We were talking about uh, Mano and Uncle Murder and the Love and Hip Hop. Every, all my favorite rappers from New York. Love and Hip Hop New York. They're all on there. Joe Button, Mano. Obviously not fucking Safari. Don't get ahead. Don't, don't you say it. I, I hear you almost at home saying, you like Safari? No, I don't like Safari. Okay. But, uh, you know, Joe Button's my favorite rapper. Mano has always been one of my favorite rappers. He's He's been underrated. Besides that surge, he had that huge mainstream surge where he was really big for a while and making those hit songs, he had like two or three back to back was firing off hit songs. But then he's kind of faded off and done his own thing and always been a fixture and a big part of the hip hop industry and underrated. So Mano and Uncle Murda, Uncle Murda tried to sign with G-Unit, but as you'll see in my G-Unit Rise and Fall video, no one can fucking sign the G-Unit unless they want their career to fail in two seconds and never put out an album or do anything successful, profitable, or beneficial to your career. So, Uncle, that hurt Uncle Murda, I think, by trying G-Unit. He should have just kept it up because, you know, he was a great rapper. He's a great lyricist, very underrated. He can make great albums and you just needs the right person to sign him. And no one has, so it's disappointing, but the yellow tape 
mixtape. It's Mano and Uncle Murda. It's a terrific mixtape. One of the best of all times. Like literally, I would put that yellow tape mixtape in the top ten. It's solid in the top ten. It may not be maybe top five, but it's close to fucking top five mixtapes ever. Like that's over Joel Santana and Lil Wayne's Lil all oh, Lil Wayne shit. I mean, there's so many mixtapes, so that's a big thing to say. But Mano and <clears throat> and Uncle Murda yellow tape that mixtape is up there. It is so good. So. You have to check that out. If you've never heard of that, you didn't know Mano and Uncle Bernard have collaborated, go check that out right now. <coughs> that sounded emotional. I don't know why. My voice cracked like that. It sounded like I was crying. Right now, check out Mano and Uncle Bernard right now. No, wait till after the video. No, seriously. Wait till after the video. But then check out Yellow Tape by Mano and Uncle Bernard. They're really underrated, obviously. Uh, Ski Mask with Slum God was my last one because people, you know, a lot of people have been asking me, hey Kevin, Kev Mac, what do you think about Ski Mask with Slum God? You know, so obviously, you know, I tell those people, and this is obviously a made up thing, so nobody's asking me who Ski Mask with Slum God is or how I feel about them, but I like to make it up in my mind, the people are asking me. So I tell those imaginary people that I made up in my mind, imaginary people, I like Ski Master Slump Guy now. I love his Stokely album, his last album is really good. Uh, I didn't like the Book of Eli, um, his last project. He said he didn't like the Book of Eli, but um, <clears throat> yeah, I didn't, I didn't like care for that project in the least, so I thought Ski Mask of Sun God was going to fall out of my my mind and vision and I wouldn't hear much from him or anything. Then he put out Stokely and completely shocked me and it was a great album. I loved it. And so now I do listen to Ski Mask of Sun God. I'm kind of getting into him. That's a new original style you've never heard before. That is a creative new style and I like it. You know, the rapping fast, but different kind of lyrics you never heard before. That's that's cool shit. Like I always thought it was, it was just rapping fast, but rapping fucking nonsense. But this last Stokely album showed me that he's actually rapping some substance. And his genius interview about it was good because you tell he has a he writes he has a lyrical process. He works on his craft and changes his bars and. So I got a lot of respect from him just off that genius, you know, lyrics interview. Um, Ski Master Slump God definitely, you know, cares about the product he's putting out. He's not just doing it for clout and money and he cares about his music and he is lyrical and, you know, sometimes he's weird or rap fast. Whatever, who isn't weird nowadays? I know why I am. Uh, Anyways, yeah, Ski Master Slump God is definitely a great up-and-coming rapper, in my opinion. Alright, next, <clears throat> let's just end, I'll go through these quickly on some news. Um, you know, I, like I said, I watch Love and Hip Hop New York. Uh, Joe Button um, proposed to uh, Sin Santana. Joe Button is getting married officially. He is engaged to Sin Santana. And since that was probably filmed six months ago, they're probably pretty close to their wedding. It's probably maybe another six months at the most away from their actual wedding. Uh, yeah, Joe Button is engaged. He finally shacked up with someone besides Tahiri and got over that. I know how tough that was for him to get over and everything, so that's a big deal. But I think San Santana's a better girlfriend. She's beautiful, obviously. You know, Tahiri is beautiful too. So, to each their own, but a Joe Button and Sin Santana seem to work together great. And good for him, I'm happy for him. Happy for Sin Santana. Seems really in love with him, so that's why you know you gotta put a ring on it, because she's like, in 
infatuated with you and you don't want to lose that. I don't think she'll never cheat on Joe, so I think he's in a great situation. He hit the jackpot, so good for him. All right, next story. Um, Kodak Black, this is probably the biggest story, and if you've been following the news at all lately, uh, Kodak Black was at Club Live in Miami, and apparently he heard that Lil Wayne was coming to show him some love. It was right around the club ending and shutting down, and after Lil Wayne didn't show up for a certain period of time, Kodak Black was on stage with his whole entourage, there's a long video of this, it's all recorded. Um, he takes the mic and says, where's Lil Wayne? Where's Lil Wayne at? He's a peon, he's a little, and this is what it says. He said, Lil Wayne should have died at birth. He should have been dead at birth or killed at birth or whatever he, you know, just said he should have died, died at birth. And uh, obviously, and Lil Wayne never showed up, and obviously people got upset about this, went crazy on Instagram and all that, and, um, you know, in the midst of everyone clapping back at Kodak, um, Lil Wayne's daughter, um, damn it, I'm saying I'm a lot, sorry guys, uh, because I'm trying to think of his Lil Wayne's daughter's name, Regine, Regine Carter, uh, came back at Kodak Black and said, you know, this shake my head, your whole album sounds like Lil Wayne's, you stole your whole style from Lil Wayne, these young guys need to show respect to the old heads that paved the way for them, and, you know, further on, further on, call them a loser or whatever. And uh, Kodak Black responded to Lil Wayne's daughter saying, you know, he explained the night that, you know, he heard Lil Wayne was coming to show him some love, Lil Wayne didn't come, and he never said anything in offense to Lil Wayne, he never would offend Lil Wayne, and he continued to say that he's 180 pounds, and Lil Wayne is not 180 pounds, obviously, he is quite light, I'm sure, and he said, that he would never put hands on Lil Wayne, that's the Carter he repeated multiple times, that's the Carter, um, he's getting too old, I think he put in there, but the big one was, nobody talked to you, to you, Lil Wayne's little bald head daughter, so apparently he called Lil Wayne's daughter a bald head, I don't know if Lil Wayne's daughter is actually a bald head or what, uh, the story is with that, I don't know where he got his information, but he called Regine a little bald head daughter. And uh, Lil Wayne's mother, Tanya Wright, um, she wrote to Kodak Black, you disrespectful son of a bitch or something along those lines, and Kodak Black basically told her back that you could get it that sink in for a little bit. That's not a moment of silence. I'm just letting that sink in. He told Lil Wayne's mother that she could get it. That he wanted to have sexual relations with Lil Wayne's mother. I know. It's crazy to meet sexual intercourse with Lil Wayne's mother. So this obviously is very offensive, but Lil Wayne never says anything back. I don't know if he had a diss track to Kodak Black or if that was just like a YouTube DJ. I hate when they do that, try to make up the fake diss tracks and they get the voice sound alike so it sounds real like the artist. So you're like, is that really the artist? I don't think so. That sounded different. You know, the voiceover actors are good. It pisses me off. They make these fucking fake diss tracks. And that happened to Lil Wayne a lot, so I don't think he did diss Kodak Black. He did, he's just too big, too in a drunk cloud, but whatever. He's in his legendary status, should be on the Mount Rushmore. He's over here, he doesn't care about Kodak Black. He doesn't need to respond for any reason, so I doubt he will. Um, but maybe after the dissing his daughter and saying he wanted to bang his mom, he might have to respond now. So. Even though Kodak Black said he meant nothing at the club, was not 
offending Lil Wayne at all by him saying, I wish you died as a baby. You should have died as a baby. He apparently wasn't, meant that in no offense. No offense. I can imagine if I said to you, hey, man, I wish you died as a little kid. No offense, though. I love you. I'm not trying to offend you. I don't know. That's his uh, rationale and reasoning there. Kodak Black was meant no harm or anything by it. You can watch the video yourself on YouTube and tell me what you think, but it sounded like he kind of meant something, in my opinion. And definitely the dissing of the daughter and mother. That's family, family members. I don't know if it's out of bounds on rap beefs. Um, I mean, we'll get into that later, but that's tough. The saying you'll bang my mom, that's where I draw the line personally. And I mean, any kid talk too. So, Kodak Black and Lil Wayne are beefing again. Even after they had Codeine Dreamin', they literally did a song together. Because if you remember, Kodak Black was always beefing with Lil Wayne. Because Lil Wayne said in an interview that he didn't know who Kodak Black or Lil Pump or XXX, all the new rappers were. Kodak Black got offended, was dissing him, calling him a bunch of names, saying he's not the best rapper alive. You know, and that seemed to be squashed when they put out Cody and Dreamin' together, and there's a song together. But apparently, it's not fully squashed. I mean, if Lil Wayne was coming to show him love, maybe it is, but Kodak Black got too drunk, did that all. I've done it many times, you wake up in the morning like, what the fuck did I do? Oh my god, did I call Lil Wayne a peon? Did I say Lil Wayne should have died at birth? Oh god damn it. There were cameras. That's. Oh, it's on YouTube video. They were recording the whole thing. God damn it. How am I gonna get out of this one? But. Happens to the best of us, and apparently his method of getting out of it was to call his daughter a bald head and. Try to bang his mom. I don't know if that's the route I would have taken. I might have done it differently personally. But hey, I can't um, hate on you for your apology techniques, I guess. So we'll see what happens with this story. Maybe we can see some Lil Wayne, you know, dissing Kodak Black tracks in the future. That'd be dope, though. I'd be here for that. A lot of dope shit there. All right, uh, quickly, let's get through this. Um, Meek Mill has a new snippet of a song on Instagram where he seems to be talking about Nicki Minaj's new ex-drug dealer boyfriend there, that, you know, the non-famous guy who you could tell is just has a shitload of money and it's definitely in illegal ways because he just got out of jail for years and blah, blah, blah. But Nicki Minaj has this new boyfriend and Meek Mill feature or snippeted a song where he talks about how every time he sees pictures of this dude, he wants to clap him and we just broke up a year ago. How can you fall in love? Are you cheating on me? You know, all this that is clearly about Nicki Minaj, although he has denied now on Twitter or whatever that it's about Nicki Minaj. Apparently it's about someone else. It's not about literally the girl he dated a year ago who's been posting pictures and would make him jealous in this. Apparently we're supposed to believe it's about someone else that Meek Mill has dated or whatever. So the Meek Mill Nicki drama and Nicki getting jealous that Meek and Drake are friends and that Meek's doing really well. His music's bigger than ever. He said he's been smashing tons of chicks and dating six, seven chicks. And Nikki's just all bitter over here. That she broke just like, eh, hey, hey, fuck you. I can just see it now. <laughs> you know, bitter and upset. I love them both and everything, but yeah, they're apparently still in love, and I wish they'd just go ahead and consummate their love already. Just get married. And they probably will, actually. So look out for that. That's a Kev Mac. I feel like I'm in podcast prediction. Meek Mill and Nicki Minaj might just get married by the end of 2019. Book it. Might put a book it. Symbol there. Just to emphasize that. 
All right, next, uh, Young Thug owes $115,000 to Icebox Jewelry. He apparently was getting uh, watches, chains, all sorts of rings, jewelry from Icebox Jewelry, and they were telling him, he says, to flaunt it in music videos, wear it out, whatever, you don't have to pay for it. It's cheaper, or discounts, or whatever. I don't know the arrangements. I only know the arrangement my jeweler gives me for my chains and watches and rings. Um, I don't know what deal he's got going on. Mine's pretty damn good. You know me. But uh, Young Thug now, after not paying them and blah 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 for, I don't know, years, months, Icebox Jewelry is now suing him for $115,000. Young Thug has to pay up or go to court or whatever. So, Young Thug owing 115 grand to Icebox Jewelry. Next topic is Nick Mira, a up and coming music hip hop producer. He produced Lucid Dreams, is his big song to his rap career credit. Um, and some would say that's the only song to his credit. Apparently he has many other new uh, rap songs produced that apparently, I don't know if anyone's ever heard, but apparently he's heard because he said he's put out many hits and he tweeted that the new generation of producers are much better than the old generation of producers. Uh, you know, I don't care what kind of criticism this comment gets, I'm just telling the truth, or blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, it's just a ridiculous false statement that I'm not even a producer and I'm offended by just being an older school uh, rap enthusiast and fan. And, you know, I'm a big Juice World and Lucid Dreams fan. I'm I'm here for that song. I love that song. I'm not gonna sit here and cap you like I don't love Lucid Dreams or Juice World or whatever. But I don't think just you can say no evidence. You can just say because that's opinionated anyways. There's no facts or evidence or whatever that the new generation of producers are better than the old generation. That's crazy, you know, that you got some good ones now, you got Metro Boomin, you got, you know, London on track, you got whatever hell of a man produces to, uh, you know, whatever the new school is. The old school though, DJ Premier, Jay Dilla, freaking Just Blaze, who we'll talk about in a second. You can put Swiss Beats in there, you can put Timbaland in there. I mean, the old generation was pretty damn good, and they didn't have the technology the new produce, produ, produ, the new producers have today. They don't have the same technology to where they can just have every effect of their hands and feet. You know, this Nick Mira guy says he he makes his own beats from scratch and plays his own uh, instruments, all sorts of instruments, but you know that he could be lying because you can he has all those effects in his uh, music editing program the older rappers the premieres that all these guys I mean they did have to know all these instruments and do so much more the technology just made it so much tougher and there was, wasn't all in one place it was getting everything together and doing each thing one by one so I think producers back a long time, if anything, had it tougher and harder. So if they weren't, their beats, you say, weren't as good or whatever as nowadays, I think it's because they had limitations and just couldn't quite make them as good now. You just have so many more effects and so many different things you can do, new producers. And obviously, maybe some of their beats will be better. But personally, I take a DJ Premier beat, I take that any day of the week. I take a J Dilla beat any day of the week over some of these newer beats. Like when a DJ Premier beat comes on, just that old school, doo -doo -tch, doo -doo -tch, like just the basic like beat, but he's the things he adds on, you know it's his beat, and you just know it's gonna be fucking fire, it's gonna be a great song, it's 
every song. I don't think DJ Premier has ever failed. He's a hundred percent. Every song he puts out is dope, so, you know, and he only works with the best, and every song is dope, so, it's just, I don't know, that's a tough thing to say. I lose a lot of respect for him, and I don't know how much respect he'll have in the industry anymore, because Just Blaze said on Twitter, Twitter, that there's dope and whack in every generation, but that aside, you have like one song, and you might not be the most qualified to speak on this topic. Ooh, that burn. That's a burn right there. From Just Blaze, too, someone he probably looks up to and admires. Just Blaze can speak on the topic, and if he says you have one song and can't speak on the topic, then you better shut the fuck up. <laughs> So all I can say about that is that Nick Mira is an idiot for posting that, and just like Just Blaze said, there's whack, and there's great in every generation, and you can't even really compare the two. It's different time, different era, different rappers. Just a stupid thing to say. All right, Young Dolph. This is, yeah, I was gonna say a funny story, but not very funny for him. He got robbed of over 500,000 dollars worth of cash, jewelry, a computer, I wonder if his music was on it too, so we're not going to have as much Young Dolph music coming up, that suck, I'm not, I'm not a fan of that, uh, a computer and a gun, uh, while he was eating at a Cracker Barrel, I believe this was in Memphis, that's where he's from, um, I believe in Memphis, uh, Cracker Barrel is down south. It's a very, very good restaurant. If those of you don't know what it is, Cracker Barrel is the shit. So, great southern, like, soul food type cooking. But a Young Dolph was eating there, just trying to enjoy his day, when he came out and literally was robbed of over 500 grand. I don't know why you'd carry that much around on you, I guess in chains and jewelry that they said they stole. I can, I can see that. The computer probably wasn't that much. I don't know if they factor in how much the gun's worth and what that is legal premises, if he had a permit to carry that or what, but they said he stole a gun, a computer, jewelry, and cash. So I wonder how much cash it was. You know rappers love to do the fucking phones and have like 20 grand of cash and apparently never heard of a bank or debit card, but I mean, that's what i do. If I got rich and famous, I would definitely just carry around lots of cash. And I'd do the phone thing, I'd do it all. I'd be the corny new money guy in a second. You'd know, you'd know I hadn't been rich for more than 15 minutes. So I can't blame anyone for doing that because I'd definitely do the same thing. So whatever, Young Dolph probably had a ton of cash and you know, that's, I, I've been to Memphis before, the Orange Mound, and I, that's tough neighborhoods. That's one of the top killing areas in the country. It's not a place you want to fuck around in, so, I don't know. If he left that in his car at a Cracker Barrel, that's kind of asking to get robbed, so. I don't know. It sucks, though. It sucks. All right. Last story. Uh, Skinny from the Nine. If you don't know who he is, he is, uh, Skinny kid, I don't know. No, he's he's a skinny, apparently Mexican kid, another kid who likes to say the N-word a lot, but looks white as fuck. I guess he looks a little more Mexican than OGZ from Shoreline Mafia, but uh, OGZ from Shoreline Mafia is way better dude than fucking skinny from the nines, a little douchebag. If you wanna try his music, listen to Don't Drown by, by him. Uh, that's his only good song that I think don't drown by Skinny from the Nine. But besides that, Skinny from the Nine's a little bitch. Uh, I don't have any personal beef with him. That's a little harsh, I'm just saying. I don't even, you know, there's there's videos of him ratting on people in the police station. And all the, there's just text messages that just came out from someone in the Nine Tray Bloods. They posted on Instagram these text messages of Skinny from the Nine trying to text him to get in the Nine Trey Bloods, because, you know, Skinny from the Nine was signed to 
train way with Shoddy, hung out with 6 9 hung out with all those guys. And these text messages show, I want to be mob. And then he explains, there's rules to this, you gotta get jumped in, you gotta live this life and do everything for them. All this stuff, all the rules. Skinny from the nine still said, I want to be in. I can catch a fade if, you know, what, six nine isn't catching no fade. The guy said actually he is, so that's interesting. I guess six nine caught the fade or got jumped in. I didn't think that happened. But he also said that six nine is buying everyone chains. You see, he said you see all those those gang members with all those chains and shit. Six nine's buying those. You can't do that. Whatever. But he said, "Fuck it, I'll buy the chains too." Skinny from the nine does always have a shit ton of money and chains and this and that. And I always wonder how. How the fuck did he get all that money? He had a shitty deal with Treyway, and Treyway went to jail and everything. He's trying to do songs with Fetty Wap, who's cold as fucking ice, hasn't put out any hit music since fucking Trap Queen, whatever it was that two two years ago now. Fetty Wap like. Benny Wap and Post Malone came out around the same time. It's like you always wondered who would stay around. You knew one of them might fail. You always kind of thought it'd be Post Malone, though. I would have bet my life savings that it'd be Post Malone and flopped and failed. But it was actually fucking Fetty Wap. So, anyways, yeah, Skinny from the Nine. That's the only one he could get on his song. So that was the only feature on his last album. It's an evil world. It was called because uh, I checked it out unfortunately and wasted my time. Wasted 30 minutes of my fucking life on the Skinny from the Nine album. I'm ashamed to say. But yeah, he uh, he got, so he was trying to be in the gang is the end of the story. He said he wanted an army at his command. He needed protection. And he does need protection. He has huge bodyguards he rolls around with. Huge fucking huge men. And he got ran out of the room by Zoe Dollar. There's that video. He went to some studio in LA. He was beefing with this Zoe Dollar's rapper. And Zoe Dollar's is running him out of the studio, running down, trying to fight. And Skinny from the Lines literally running away. And his security, you know, corner, hugs him and carries him to the car outside, basically. Because he doesn't want any smoke with Zoe Dollar's. So, ah. Uh, you know, that happens, and then the text messages happened when he was trying to get in the gang, saying, you know, pay him. You know, there was further beef with Zoe Dollars. Like, there's the beef with No Jumper. He said he'd beat up No Jumper. You know, he can't beat up anybody. He's like 90 pounds soaking wet. He looks like a little bit. I don't even want to do much news on it, but he got robbed by YBN Almighty J at a music video shoot they were apparently doing together a Skinny from the Nine song, so YBN Almighty J was on the track. He was invited to the music video to do the feature. I guess he did that. They shot the music video and everything, and there's a video of this on TMZ, got the video, of the uh, parking lot, the front, Skinny from the Nine. It's at nighttime, so you can't see well. It's night vision. Skinny from the Nine standing in the back seat, outside of the back seat of the SUV with the car door open. You see he's talking to YBN Almighty J right in front of him. Then a car pulls up, five or six dudes run out, run towards him, run to Skinny from the Nine. You see him push him inside, and obviously they're running his fucking chains, wallets, everything. They run all the shit off him. And then everyone leaves, including YBN Almighty J. They get in the car, skirt off. And that's it. Skinny from the Nines robbed. I'm sure the first of many times that he'll be robbed. Uh, I'm sure we could expect many more of this to come. Now that everyone realized we're fucking retards for not just robbing Skinny from the Nine every time we literally see him. That stupid wild cash and that fucking stupid chains and face. <laughs> God, that sounds like a hate fest. I'm just reporting the news that YBN Almighty J, it's caught on camera, TMZ has it, they released it. It's clearly him and his boys pull up and they all come out, they rob Skinny, and they all ride off. And YBN Almighty J has denied this is true, said he is innocent, he is not, um, not guilty of this crime. 
Skinny from the Nine, actually, which is why I wanted to do the story. And I think it's the funniest. He tried to frame it as that it was fake and that it was staged for the music video, that that was a scene in the music video that YBN Almighty J and his crew apparently robbed him in the music video and ride off with all his cash and jewelry. And apparently that was the uh, image he had for the music video. That's what, hey director, uh, I know you wanted to do the normal, like, you know, in the club, turning up, girls, money, everything. But wind up for this music video, I got a new direction. Think of this, I get robbed by the guy I'm featuring in the song. Like, why do you know my G, Almighty J, comes in, he robs me of all my chains, money, everything, jewelry, all of it and just drives away, and I just, I'm like, what, what happened, nerd? <laughs> so how is that a scene in the music video is the point? Where, what scene is that that a rapper wants to get robbed in a music video? I mean, I don't know, man. I hate that to be, I just thought that was hilarious. So right now, the police report came out and yes, why uh, Skinny from the Nine Snitch called the cops on YBN Almighty J. The police report has came out. There is an actual police report and statement and everything. YBN Almighty J will, I'm sure, be arrested for it. But he is innocent until proven guilty. And Skinny from the Nine is obviously a snitch and told the cops about this. And it is real. It's not fake. Because why would you call the cops? on your music video scene so it's clearly real and clearly a uh, sad I don't know it's not sad it's funny as hell funny as hell case so all right um you know I want to get in more now in the next half hour on Love and Hip Hop New York and the finale and Joe Dunn getting married and arguments with Mayno and all my boys. Let's just talk about love and hip hop for uh, the next half hour. All right. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. We're not going to talk about that anymore. But uh, how I feel about all my favorite rappers on that show, I would do it though. I'd probably do a reality show in my life now that I'm getting more comfortable in front of the camera. I'm enjoying this. I love talking to you guys. Gives me practice to talk and be social and get over my anxiety and gives me practice editing videos and making each video better and better and more effects and just more everything. So, I don't know. I'd probably do a reality show like that. Just, you know, it'd probably be fun. Get your name out there more. So, I can't blame, you know. Mayno's not in the mainstream anymore. Joel's Joe Button kind of is with his podcast, but you know, it's probably a good bag, you know, and we're going to turn that down. So I don't know. I'd probably do it. So that's my feelings on that topic. But, anyways, it's been a great show, guys. I know I went way overboard once again and talked for when I said it was going to be a half hour, it turned into an hour and a half. I meant to be concise, but I don't know how to be concise. I guess I just ramble. I guess I got so much information and knowledge that I want to share with you up here in my brain. I just have to have to do it and it takes me a while and you're going to have to sit there and you're going to have to enjoy it. I don't know what to say. But whenever we'll be back with a whole lot more dope shit tomorrow. Uh, look out for the rise and fall of G-Unit video. I'm gonna be shooting that tonight or even tomorrow morning. I'm reshooting it because of my stupid lighting at night. But uh, we'll be shooting that video. But the biggest video that's coming up uh, on Friday, I wanna drop it, is the best ever diss tracks and the best ever beefs in rap, hip hop, whatever, in other worlds, maybe other music worlds if possible. But the best beef and diss tracks, so please comment. You send me messages. I've already got one from my friend Colin. I appreciate that. 
and you know where that song will be. So uh, just definitely vote in on, on your favorite diss tracks, your favorite beefs of all time. It's going to be a great episode. It's going to be a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, I hope this video is better than the last sounds better. I hope that fuzzing and everything's away. So, look at guys, we're growing, we're getting better, we're growing and progressing together, and improving together, helping each other. Help me help you, or you help me, however that goes. But, I'm glad you guys are sticking with me. Thank you for being my day one fans. Believe me, in the end, you're going to be like, I watched him from the beginning, and he's really, really proud of him. Thank you very much, guys. This is the I Feel Like Rhyming podcast. Kev Mac here, once again, by the fireplace. Coolest podcast you've never heard yet. Hopefully, you will hear soon, though. I Feel Like Rhyming. Kev Mac, signing off. Peace. Boom.